Thanks, dear viewers, for joining us on this edition of the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Equinox Television Live from my headquarters in Cameroon's economic camp to Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, the chairman of the National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms of the Republic of Cameroon, Dr. Chimuta Divine Banda, decries continuous violation and abuse of human rights by armed groups and the military in the northwest and south west regions of the republic of cameroon the national chairman of the commission on human rights and freedom indicates that the commission has been working to ensure the protection and promotion of human rights in cameroon but is uh, suffering as a result of several stumbling blocks notably coming from the administration hindering it from doing its job in this newscast will also show you the deplorable living conditions of the people of uh, balige it is a locality in bambalang in the northwest region of the republic of cameroon the population are complaining that they have been abandoned by the yaoundé administration stay with us The chairman of the National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms of the Republic of Cameroon has said that human rights continue to be violated and abused in the northwest and southwest regions of the country within the context of the deepening socio-political and security tensions in those parts of the country which has been pulling on for close to three years today. The national chairman indicates that human rights are violated by the military in those two regions and abused by armed groups in the anglophone parts of the country and this is contained in the latest report on the situation of human rights so the respect of human rights in cameroon published by the commission today in yaoundé take a listen to dr chimuta divine banda chairman of the national commission on human rights and freedoms of cameroon human rights resulting from the continuous use of violence and which has created the emergence of groups that you cannot even identify because you have the initial uh, uh, groups that armed groups that were trying to fight to defend themselves but in addition to that you've now you've also had a whole lot who have constituted groups around themselves to make gains, capture people and obtain ransom from them, not in the agenda, certainly it must be clear that that would not normally be in the agenda of the people who initially started fighting to obtain certain uh, uh, desires of theirs. So confusion has come in and that confusion has led to uh, suspicion and people are suspecting that one is either on one side or the other side so even our civil our, our security and defense forces would look at population in the village as supporting the amber boys and when they want to attack it is sometimes it's indiscriminate you've heard You've heard people who have gone to the field saying that it is indiscriminate. They just attack and kill without making sure that they identify the people who have committed uh, the offense and deal only with those people. So, and then the same thing would be the, uh, with the Amber Boys who, who, who suspect some villagers for cooperating with the uh, security and defense forces to commit atrocities on them. So it's, it's a situation that's not good. We have to seek to end it. Uh, the are violations of human rights. Over the years, the National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms of the Republic of Cameroon have been uh, complaining about uh, numerous obstacles to its activities uh, coming notably from the administration. They are often denied access 
to some uh, areas, in, including incarceration uh, centers and, of course, insecurity in some parts of the country has also been a major challenge uh, hindering some of the activities of the National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms. And we asked the national chairman of that uh, commission, Dr. Chimuta Jiven Banda, what the commission has been doing. And this is what he said. Going back to 2013 with maritime piracy, through 2014 with Boko Haram in the far north, and then 2016 and 17 with the problems in the northwest and the southwest. And uh, so we're in, in 2018, we are still co we are coping with those issues, uh, security problems. Uh, which were affecting our development in many ways. And we were, in the course of that year, making sure that people who were displaced as a result of those um, situations, who had become internally displaced people, would be paid attention. And that those of them who were refugees, that attention would be paid to them. And that people who were arrested as a result of the uh, movements will be properly treated as suspect, tried and punished accordingly, and uh, avoiding any use of um, extrajudicial execution. But you also know that 2018 was an election year, an important election year. We observed, we monitored the two elections, the senatorial election, and we produced a report which we published here. We also monitored the presidential election. But in addition to that, we had our permanent secretariat promoting and protecting, um, and protecting human rights and cooperating with other bodies to promote and protect human rights. And taxi drivers in the northwest regional capital, Bamenda, uh, decrying and of course uh, condemning the violation of the rights by uniform men uh, position in the numerous checkpoints at different uh, parts of the town and of course they are uh, indicating uh, that they are being um, deprived of some of their uh, belongings notably many illegally by some of the uniform men and this is why uh, they went they were on a sit in strike yesterday for me armstrong sander has more the gathered under the umbrella of the northwest regional chapter of the cameroon drivers trade union the group of transporters plying the Bamenda Bamili stretch of roads decry the erection of multiple control posts, which they say is used by forces of law and order to extort money from them. The, control of Bamili, the control posts along the stretch are too many and just so unbearable. For several months now, we have been suffering as a result of the increased number of checkpoints, which are only used to extort money from oil. They say 13 checkpoints have been raised along the few kilometer stretch of road from Bamenda to Bambili, and taxi drivers are obliged to pay 1,000 francs CFE at each of the checkpoints. Imagine you spend that much money, whereas a driver can only make 20,000 francs in a day. You need to put fuel and also give money to your proprietor. We pack our vehicles here. We cannot continue to work again. The Bamenda Bambili Township taxi drivers who present themselves as victims of the Anglophone crisis say they are paying a huge price. Therefore, the motor, when we use them, it needs maintenance. But at the end of the day, we will not be able to meet up one, even for do the maintenance. Secondly, for fuel your motor, and thirdly, for people that get family. They not be able to even survive. Frustrated and fed up by the situation, the drivers parked their vehicles at the city chemist roundabout in the heart of the northwest regional chief town Bamenda, in a sit-in strike action. Too many control to be reduced to one or two per day if they must go to the road. The prime minister during his last visit to Bamenda was worried to hear that why government is making effort to end this crisis. Others continue to make the population unhappy and instructed the governor and the SD for Mezam to solve this problem. After the departure of the prime minister, the governor wrote to Sinesta informing us that the senior divisional officer has been charged to handle the matter. 
see copy of this letter attached. See, there nothing has been done. The immediate consequence of the strike action fell on Yuba students who could not go to Bambili from the heart of the city of Bamenda. I was supposed to have a class by 10 and I'm still here. I don't know the fate, the fate of the class. I don't even know what, if I'm going to go to school today again because since the day is already like it's going, I don't think I will go to school again. So I've lost the class of today. Just like the drivers, students say they suffer huge financial losses as a result of the multiple checkpoints. We now pay them 700 francs instead of 500. At times we pay 800 francs, to which the normal fare is 500. And to all students, really, it's a very big burden. They also understand the plight of taxi drivers and the effort of administrative officials in a complex security atmosphere like the Northwest region. They were going to be that, that there were going to be some security measures that, that would be taken to ensure the security of the students, and that that seemed to be the problem because in trying to enforce the security, more control posts have been mounted on the way, which is like detrimental to the driver. The drivers also requested that taxis be suspended to almost zero, and forwarded their concerns to the Northwest Governor, the Minister of Territorial Administration in Cameroon, the Prime Minister the National Trade Union of Taxi Drivers in Cameroon and His Eminence Christian Cardinal Tumi, head of the Peace and Sensitization Caravan to the Northwest region. The people of Ekondo Titi in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon uh, recently took the peace caravan sent by a son of the soul, Prime Minister Chief Dr. Joseph John Gute, around the community to show them the uh, deplorable state of the area and uh, calling on them to do something to take concrete actions to solve the problems, the underdevelopment problems affecting the municipality and one of the major problems in that part of the country is uh, bad roads. Many of the roads running across the Kondo Titi are in an advanced state of dilapidation. Details with Dere Jato. The people of the Kondo Titi subdivision did not only table their problems in writing but also took these post major national dialogue peace caravan delegation round and showed them what they are talking about top among bad road we have to move to three places the Kondo Titi itself Lobe Town and Bongongo public health too is another challenge here the population in one voice told these delegations sent by the Cameroon Prime Minister and head of government and to give us hospitals because uh, we survive great deal as far as health is concerned their future is their children, reason why the back to school campaign team should not relent, they add. Let their schools come back, let their children go back to school. This area of the Prime Minister, any special way to the Prime Minister? Yes, I'm giving special words to him for sending a delegation to come and tell us exactly what was discussed at the level of the national dialogue. The leader of the peace caravan, Honorable Njume Peter Ambang, Member of Parliament for Ekondo Titi and Dikomebalue subdivisions gave reasons why he rates the peace mission as successful. The mission has been very, very successful. And you can see that after we talked to the people in Lobe Town, one of their sons who was in the bush and decided to meet us to say it is over. And we are very grateful to him. Because it is time for us now to talk peace. It is time for us to forget about the past. I'm very, very satisfied with the response. The response, you can see that one of them has come out of the bushes. And he's telling us that many of his friends are going to follow suit. These people of the Kondo Titi subdivision in the Indian division are also seriously hit by the crisis. As Pamo Plantation, one of the major income avenues, has been greatly destroyed. Up next, a Northwest correspondent, Mbu Stella, takes us to Bafege, a locality in Bambalang, in the Northwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. The people are complaining that they have been abandoned. They have been abandoned by the Yaoundé administration. The locality lacks basic amenities. We have details with Mbu Stella. 
um, we'll start out with that report on the population of uh, Bafugui in the Bambalang in the northwest region of the Republic of uh, Cameroon. I will take uh, something else before we come back to that report. The slave trade center in the Bimbia is also another area and this time around a tourist attraction which has been abandoned and of course our reporter uh, Smanjikan Gebre was there he brought back this report Bimbia was supposed to be one of the most developed subdivision in Limbe Fako division of the southwest region today this place you have this left trade village this left trade village has become a national heritage and the government is pursuing it. It has been declared a World Heritage Center. Now it's racism. Tourists are coming from all over the world. They won't come and see this little village. But look at the road. Unfortunately, notwithstanding its natural resources, it is underdeveloped and sending away possible investors to the area. One of the areas tourists would have loved to visit and generate income for the Limbe 3 Council is the historic slave trade site that has been abandoned in the forest because of the lack of means to maintain it. From the main gate into the slave trade village itself is about 1.5 kilometers walk, according to what our guide told us. Within the slave trade site, our first stop over was at the oil production factory, where slaves were forced to produce palm oil. Few meters away from the oil production factory was the area stubborn slaves were being chained while awaiting for their transfer out of the country. When the big ship comes, you have come to Nico Island, they send out a small boat to come and pick the slaves. Mm -hmm. When you close that door, you are going to go. The door, our guy told us, whenever a slave crossed the door, he will never return because he will be taken to another country. The next stopover was at the open air market of the enslaved weighing and inspection station where slaves are weighed before being sold. Then came the water and feeding station. The slaves with chains on their legs and hands ate directly with their mouth before water is being served on the same platform for them to drink. Nico Island was the area where the bigger ship that came to carry slaves stopped before smaller boats came to pick up the slaves. For the stubborn slaves who want to escape into water, this cannon that still lies in the middle of the sea was used to fire them. When the slave trade was gradually ending, that Christianity was introduced, the Negro Jamaican-born missionary Joseph Merrick landed in 1843 and opened the first ever church, which still stands very tall and used by the Baptists today. Alfred Seca, who also landed on the shores of then Victoria, left this building, which still date serves for several purposes to tourists. Unfortunately, notwithstanding this endowment, Bimbia is inaccessible with poor road network. Some traders at the Mbopi market in Cameroon's economic capital dweller whose shops were recently consumed by wild flames are still struggling to take off from the debris. Uh, many of them are still uh, battling to put their activities back on track. And of course, this is uh, because of the impact of the a fire that consumed almost everything in most of the shops affected and they have also been barred from uh, reconstructing they have been uh, prohibited from uh, reconstructing the uh, shops by the Douala city uh, council and electricity is yet to be restored in that market i mean iluga reports it's been a generator sing song after the fire incident November the 11th, 2019, at the Dwala-based Mbopi Market. The whole market is dark 
this. We are only this. Greetings, Kabamono, outside, everywhere, everywhere. We don't know. All these type of things can provoke citizens to behave otherwise. You have your, uh, your, your, your right on something and you cannot get it. Here in Littoral, on the 5th of December 2018, we sent our situation in the market, the traders union, send a letter to them to see if they can come and evaluate a new installation of the sonnet metal here in our market. But during that time, they spent more than five months. They replied us in April 2019. And it was something like they are trying to drag it back to be a contract between the Sonel and the, the council. So they don't give us a good reply because we wanted them to give us, and they even come out with a, a spare, they call him a spare, uh, yes, come out, and the spare come out with a resort because we wanted to take the amount of money and divide it each, each business plan in the market to, to pay for us to have a good electricity. But look at it. The derailments of the the people of the Sonel or Inyo, look at what happened. The traders have been struggling this way against your wish. No electricity in the entire market, meanwhile, they say. There was a foundation. Those people in the commune brought some, uh, they say, ad hoc committee to control the light here in the market. So the place where they wanted to plant the transformer was not good in the market. So we, the, uh, the businessmen, we refuse that position. We ask them to look for another place which will be comfortable to each and every one. And within that day, the fire brigade, it disturbed them. That place disturbed them to enter and pour down the fire. After the fire, they, they went and looked for another place up uh, around the Fiperi area. I don't know if they are still continuing the project or they are not continuing the project. I don't know. Away from electricity squabbles, traders who had their shops consumed by the recent flames in the markets on November the 11th this year are battling to survive. Most who borrowed money from banks to invest into their businesses are today experiencing tough times. I lost almost all. I, before I came, the fire had damaged all my shop, nearly all my shop. And as I'm telling you, when I used to operate, I pay my, my, my monthly uh, dues to the, the, the fiscal dues. I have employees and all the likes and all of us now and the employees and my family we only depend on this little business that has gone all into flames. We don't know how we can do. They come and they come and help us to finance and finance and to build the shops. Among the number of shops erased, some 22 victims have on your part began administrative follow-ups to see into which that business revamps on a proper note. It's those who lost their shop, I'm the head to see how we can do to bring back the shop. We are 22 of us and we are 22 of us as you can see. Something that we can go and meet uh, the government delegate to give us a uh, permit debate. While waiting to rebuild the shops and have the site for the electricity transformer put in place as promised, the traders as it's now wonder how possible they could make ends meet this end of year when business normally booms. And latest news streaming into our studio from the nation's political capital, Yaoundé, indicate that the Social Democratic Front, the said, is not going to take part in the upcoming municipal and legislative elections scheduled for February 9, 2020, in the Republic of Cameroon. And the news comes from a press conference granted by the first vice president of the Social Democratic Front, Honorable Osi Joshua, in Yaoundé, who has said that as long as the Anglophone crisis uh, continues, the Social Democratic Front is not going to take part in any election in the country and this is coming days after the CRM, the Cameroon Renaissance Movement Political Party through the president of that party, Professor Maurice Camto, said it will boycott the February 9, 2020 municipal and legislative elections in Cameroon. The two main opposition political parties in Cameroon, the STF and the CRM, have thus announced the uh, boycott of the February uh, 
2020 elections in the Republic of Cameroon for that complicating the pressure mounting on the President of the Republic and including international pressure with the three uh, top diplomats who were in Cameroon or were still in Cameroon. Notably, the uh, chairman of the African Union Commission, the secretary general of the Commonwealth, and of course, the secretary general of the International Organization of La Francophonie. And of course, uh, we have other political parties that had earlier declared that they will not take part in the elections, including the Cameroon People's Party, the Popular Action Party, and uh, others will be keeping you updated as soon as we are informed. Now we go out of the country to talk about the situation in the Benin and the Beninese government has ordered the EU uh, Commission ambassador to leave the country no later than December 1, 2019. The German-born diplomat Olivier Nete is accused uh, to have taken uh, or to have taken um, in activities, taking part in activities uh, Benin considers as subversive details with Innocenazi. Governments of the West African nation moved to expel Olivier Net, EU ambassador from the country, of interfering in domestic political affairs and constantly calling on civil society to protest against the government. Jeune Afrique magazine cited sources in the government are saying that NET on several occasions and during various meetings undermined the legitimacy of the current parliament elected in April under a new controversial election law. Later on Wednesday, a government spokesperson said the cooperation with the EU had been disturbed by the activities of this diplomat who has got involved in activities which they may consider subversive. Meantime, the decision to expel Olivier Net was served to the European bloc one week ago by Benin authorities. For the EU spokeswoman, nothing can justify such a measure in the generally good relations that have existed up until now between the EU and Benin. She told Agence France Press that they have demanded as a matter of urgency from their partners in Benin some clarification on the specific reasons for their decision. Benin has been facing a political crisis since parliamentary votes in April. Anti-government protesters took to the streets and clashed with security forces calling for President Patrice Talon to step down. The president took power in 2016. Now we wrap up the first segment of this newscast with an advertorial on activities of the Soninka uh, Association, an initiative brought up by the Society of Women and uh, AIDS in Africa, founded in 1991. That association is stepping up uh, efforts to uh, assist uh, patients of uh, HIV AIDS and it now has a new building that will be hosting its headquarters immaculate for society for women and aids in africa swali Turau, founded in 1988 has served as a primary organization targeting persons living with hiv and aids by offering them services that can promote and support independent functioning for victims to improve their quality of life and to maintain optimum health care services. The new structure at the Community Medical Center, Margaret Sanga, located in the Yasin neighborhood at the east entry to the city of Douala, has seen the light of day. Soa Center Littoral is a community center which offers services and follows up patients suffering with HIV and AIDS. Before, we were renting aqua, but the rents were so high. So, a fundraising was organized by Soa Littoral with other local enterprises giving their own contributions. With that, we were able to construct this structure. This structure, which stands at over 110 million CFA friends, is the fruits of the effort of partners and persons of goodwill, a gesture appreciated by the Society for Women and AIDS in Africa. 
The former director of the Douala Lakantini Hospital, who is currently the government delegate to the Douala City Council, saw the birth of this spectacular project. I am very surprised with the solidarity portrayed in the association. SWA is a movement I have known for over 20 years. I witnessed the birth of the association while I was a doctor and director of the Lacantony Hospital. They have always remained united and this is what I call the force of experience. The inaugural ceremony saw the cutting of the ribbon by the government delegate to the Douala City Council. The foundation stone of the surgery block worth 125 million CFA francs has been laid and it will be open soon to the public for diverse medical needs. Talking point is up next. Thanks for staying with us in Talking Point. We're receiving a political analyst, a lecturer of law in higher institutions of learning in Cameroon. Ako John Ako, you're welcome. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. Latest news streaming in from Miawundi indicates that the Social Democratic Front has also decided to boycott the uh, February 9, 2020 uh, presidential or rather municipal and legislative elections in uh, Cameroon. The SDF had earlier uh, taken a decision like this and uh, backtracked later and said we're going to take part in the elections and now it comes back to say we are not going for the elections and this coming few days after the CR and political party also took the same decision. What's your analysis of this uh, recent development? Yeah, it is um, something that we were not expecting, hoping that um, before even the legislative elections were announced, SDF said if the problems and the trouble uh, hitting the two regions of the northwest and the southwest were not resolved, they were not going to stand for elections. And we were again within 48 hours realized that SDF decided to run for the same elections. Today, we comes at a time to tell us that Cameroonians as a whole and the Cameroonian public are fed up with the system and it is what we have been calling. If there is a boycott of a general elections, we intended to see the whole opposition classmates or friends of the same opposition leaders in Cameroon to stand under a single platform, which means there is unity within the opposition parties. But if we still see that some of the parties that have already deposited the applications are going in for the elections, I don't know to how far. But one thing we need to learn is that equally, what we call empty seat uh, politics have never won anything for Cameroonians. Remember the historic boycott of the SDF election in 1992 for, uh, for him to select those who were to represent their members at the level of the National Assembly has put Cameroon into the meltdown where we are today that the CPDM controls majority of the House. In many dictatorial regimes, several times when oppositions are forced to decline on the eve of an election, it might and has never caused anything to those dictatorships which simply go a long way to consolidate themselves in power. This is what the head of state and the New Deal government has done since 1992. You remember the popularity SDF had in 1990 and where SDF is today. And again, many Cameroonians were having hopes that with the recent political tension in the country, political parties should equally participate in elections so that they will give a reflection of what Cameroonians are thinking. But at the same time, if they are denouncing and complaining of taking themselves out of this particular race, it leaves a lot of hope for those who are thinking that if there was opportunity to be given, they can change the mandate of the legislative, they can change the mandate of the mayors that are all being controlled by the same ruling party for the past 37 years. Can the, we the, make something otherwise the for C Cameroon? The CRM and the SDF, the CPP, and all the other elections, uh, the other political parties, apart from the CPP, which stands for a political transition in Cameroon, nothing else but a political transition, the other parties uh, are saying that the electoral code is bad, the electoral system is bad, the anglophone crisis is still persisting and deepening, so there is no reason it's not proper to organize elections in this present context. Are you saying that this, this decision is not appropriate because you were talking about armchair politics which has never produced anything for Cameroonians, according to you? Yeah, what I'm saying is we have been in the parliament for over 
since the New Deal, 37 years, we have never seen a private member bill being tabled before the House. And several times, we simply make propaganda. I have not seen of an intention where the SDF, the MROC party, had proposed a bill to harmonize elections in Cameroon. If the electoral code is evil, why then do we even conduct the presidential election? Why did the same party stood for the senatorial elections? Why the interest presently at the level of parliamentary and municipal elections? It simply gives us an indication that somewhere the political parties also might have been caused so frustrated by the regime in place. We should go for election. We should at times use pertinent points before elections are organized, we needed to see a coalition of the same opposition vying and fighting for the same electoral code to be revised. We have been in the same parliament for the past mandate. We have not seen any private member bill on the subject. There is a room within the constitution of Cameroon that gives right to members of parliament to present private member bills. I don't want to believe that the withdrawal of the SDF from the race gives an indication of the visits we have been seeing to Cameroon and the tension that had been bounded around it to, around it to the palace. And people believe that surely the election may be postponed. And a lot of Cameroonians have been a possible postponement of election right before this hour that the SDF is announcing not standing. Which means when we look at the political, you said within your news that there was the head of the EU, uh, the, 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 the EU Commission, the Commonwealth and the African Union all coming in block. A lot has been said within at the level of the Unity Palace and we believe very strongly that there is feeling that there is going to be a possible postponement of elections in Cameroon. But what I still insist is that the errors of 1992 and where Cameroonians are today, which the SDF itself still stand to regret, should not repeat itself now. Dictatorial regimes have always profited on the eve of the frustration that caused opposition parties. I will tell you that if the state will tell you that the state of law will be maintained and they will go ahead to organize the same elections, we saw during the senatorial elections that people left their constituency and voted out of the zones and elections were won 100% by the same party. They can still stand under the same front. They have the army, they have the police, they have the gendarmes. You won't do anything in Cameroon. We are living in a sort of system where we know that the system has collapsed and one or two persons still hold it in power. In fact, it's statistics even given that less than 1% of Cameroonians have held 99% hostage in terms of governance and transparency. Democracy has no place in Cameroon. We are living what we call a free crazy, meaning within Cameroon we have defined our own democracy that we organize elections and the winner is known even before elections are conducted. It is not new in Cameroon. How can we understand this forward and backward movement of the social democratic front? We are not going, it's not proper to organize elections in the present context with the Anglophone crisis, the electoral code, the electoral system, but and then later we are going for the elections and then today uh, we are not going for the elections for the same reasons. Yeah, what I'm telling you here that is this forward and backward movement. It, obviously, it is forward and backward because the political climate in Cameroon is frustrating for the opposition. When you look at the SDF, the SDF thought like after the presidential elections, since the stronghold of the Northwest and the Southwest, nothing was done. And he came that they are now classified as a fourth political party. They had within themselves to equally know that everybody counts on what he has. Even and though even though it remains the leading political party in Cameroon when we talk about the number of parliamentary seats when and we talk about parliamentarians, councils and councillors and so on. Yes, most often than not when we talk of that, but remember the same parliamentarian's mandate has expired and just had been pushed forward over twice, which means it is rather unconstitutional from the time the decision of the President of the Republic convoked new legislative and municipal elections in 29 uh, uh, February 2019 equally gives an indication that the mandate of this particular people no longer exists. So on what basis will say that the SDF still remains a popular party becomes a problem. And the controversy, what I'm saying here, is that really there is need for even the head of state to resign from power after 37 years. The center can no more hold. Politics can no longer go. Democracy, Cameroonians are being molested. Others don't have basic health facilities. The same people every day go abroad for medical treatment, then you expect us to be treated in clinics and roadside drugs, and then we come later to stand within the same opinion we have promised. Many schools don't even have benches, other schools without roofs. A lot of social uncomfortness in Cameroon. A basic Cameroonian has no means to even fit itself. And then we see the same person standing in the same position. What political embarrassment? I will tell you that if we need to assess a political opinion, you realize that... Does that explain the backward and forward movement? I am, that is the back? exact position of the SDF, the political parties have simply just been frustrated that any Cameroonian who aligns with an opposition party in Cameroon becomes a direct enemy 
to some people and even an enemy to the whole system. Remember before the MROC party told you the, the molestation they went through the civil status or uh, what we call them civil administrators to even get just the resident permit to indicate that they have been the zone. Within all these days, uh, DOs, SDOs, mayors, nobody works again in his office. All of them said they are concentrating also in their own primaries to select who will go in for parliament or municipal election to the detriment of the Cameroonian you, people. You, you, may meet, you may not be the right person to answer this question because you are not an official of the Social Democratic Front, but as a political uh, analyst, what do you think about these uh, uh, suspicions of um, a double game some critics think that the SDF is playing a double game with the Yaoundé administration, with the CPDM, that the, the SDF is playing a game on uh, individual interests, on egocentric interests. Now, it might not have been an egocentric interest if the decision is coming from the highest office. In fact, the vice president of that party, meaning it is a consensus, a general consensus of the party. Many might have not been equally okay with the decision, but I will tell you that in a level, at the level of the political party, decisions are not made by the general public, and they are made by specific bureau of that same house. It is not a gone back, and I think it is just a game. Politics is a game, and within several times, Cameroonians have even accused the SDF party to have aligned since after 1992, to have aligned with the student party to molest and even manipulate politics within the country. I don't know how far this is, but I still know that some time ago, the president, the chairman of that party, said there can be never elections in the Northwest and the Southwest if the Southern Cameroon problem is not handled. We need that to be done, and that should be now. Opportunity come at once, and I believe I'm saying that there should be a unity of opposition if we need to make Cameroon work perfect. We don't need single party. Uh, politics in Cameroon, if opposition need to work, let them have or come into a common platform and make a unilateral decision towards this election, then I think the heat will just be at the beginning, considering that the ruling party may have nothing to count on, simply just done to revise the electoral code and even other electoral system or electoral laws which we are complaining when about. When you look at all of what is happening now, what do you foresee as far as these elections are concerned? Yeah, we just hope that the president will adhere to what the other parties are claiming. I said we need a good electoral system. I was amazed when I saw in places like Hong Kong that 22 years old pupils and youths have been voted in today local council elections while in Cameroon at 22 children are still begging for food. Those who have certificate still don't have something to lean on. How then can we stand for politics? Can we bring down the electoral system to a, a level that a child who has ambition can equally be voted? Removing the age value for those who can be parliamentarians, can we come to a level where politics can serve the interests of all, not the individual interests of certain parliamentarians? Thanks, Ako John Ako. You are a political analyst and a lecturer of law. Thanks for coming. The pleasure is mine. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.